and we are recording now. It's uh, it's I'm Henry the Fiddler, and this is Deva Sherman, and we are in the beautiful Rio Grande Gorge here near Taos, New Mexico, actually Arroyo Hondo and there you can see the Rio Grande down there and um, maybe you can hear hear the water rushing over the rocks, I don't know but it's just a really quiet day, it's um, I think it's Tuesday, May 22nd, 2018 and we just thought this would be a nice place to uh, make a video about Grandfather David. So, here we go. Can we start with a picture of our, of our brother? Yes. I'll come over there and we'll zoom right in on, on David. This is a picture of Grandfather David um, speaking to the council. At, he, he came to just one gathering, right? Mm-hmm. That was in 1977 in New Mexico. We were near Truth or Consequences, right? Near there. It was on the East Fork of the Gila, right near the Gila Wilderness border as well. And it was a, a beautiful place that lived hundreds, thousands, thousands of years ago when they were on their migrations. What else have we got? We've got a few a few other photos we can share with everybody. So Grandfather David came to the Rainbow Gathering in 77, 94 years old, totally blind, and he rode in on horseback with a young Aleutian native brother, Antelope, riding double behind him. And as you can see, when he was speaking, we all got just as close as we possibly could, sitting on the, on the ground, hundreds of us, thousands of times. And he had about, I don't know, 94 pounds soaking wet, but with a really strong, clear voice. And everyone was so attentive that if we'd been sitting on a wooden floor, you could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> He stayed right in the teepee circle with us for three days and nights. Absolutely had a wonderful time. And we were so thrilled to have him. Oh yeah. Now these photographs are archival and they've been red shifted and we're going to be correcting them um, in coming months and years, but um, you can still get a good idea of what it looked like. Um, and here he is right here, standing up, getting ready to speak. Now, I see a brother and sister, or is it, there's a couple of people on either side of them, of him. Do you know who those folks were or what they were doing? Well, uh, Pukalani was the one who brought Grandfather David to the gathering. Pukalani invited him, and he he was very happy to come. And is she, is she one of the two people on either side of him? Do you know who those folks are? Well, you know what? They've got their heads down a little bit. I can't really see their faces. Uh-huh. What else we got here? This is uh, Grandfather David and Sonny, Sonny Mason. And this was uh, the second time we got to visit with him or see him. This was in 1979, right before the Arizona gathering. And um, Sonny and I went over to New Mexico to Mount Taylor. And there was a big um, four-day conference, rally, music, wonderful uh, get together of many, many people, thousands of people, to protest the mining, uranium mining, at the sacred mountain, Mount Taylor. And a brother named John Friesel brought grandfather over. And uh, there were wonderful speakers and lots of native speakers, Dene and Hopi. 
and Grandfather David spoke of on the last day. Bonnie Raitt and Jackson Brown and other people played music for everybody. It was a really special time. Okay, what else we got here? Oh, do you want to talk about that now or maybe a little later? Okay, I'm just going to show it to you. Okay. This is the petroglyphs on the Prophecy Rock. And Grandfather David had a banner that he unfurled at the gathering that had all this laid out on the, on the banner, the cloth banner. And at the gathering, he explained to us what the meaning was of this prophecy, um, which I will tell you about later. But then, um, after the gathering, and uh, about a year or so after that, I started visiting Grandfather David on a regular basis. On the I, way to what? I started visiting him on a regular basis. Oh, on a regular basis, yeah. okay. And I would, uh, I lived in New Mexico then, a couple hour drive, and I'd go over and spend a week at a time and help out him and his, his wife, Nora. And she was totally deaf and he was totally blind and they worked together as one as one and during that time I got to do a lot of different things with him I'll tell you about that more but um, he also took me just the two of us we went up to the prophecy rock one day and he again explained explained all the inscriptions and what they meant so, so you actually saw this what we're looking at you saw it in person yes I've been to it several times it's uh, above Second Mesa, above Kukutsmavi, not too far off the road. So this is near where he was living? Right, yes. I see. Do we have another photo, or is that... I think is this that... is the last one. Yep. Okay. Well, as long as I'm here, close up, why don't you go ahead and talk about the prophecy book? Okay. <clears throat> I can zoom in, you know, on any particular part that you want to talk about. Okay, this this uh, this prophecy rock is really. Uh, you need to, you need to hold it more straight uh, up and down. Vertical, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm getting a I'm getting a glare. Okay. There we go. Uh, this prophecy rock um, has been there for mm, maybe 1,100 years and maybe longer, you know, who knows. But um, this was inscribed on the rock after they had a meeting in Raibi with the uh, very powerful Masao. And Masao is the guardian spirit of the earth. And he appeared before the Hopis and taught them how they were to live on this land. This was after they... Can you say that word again? Masao. 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 And that's the... That's the in this is the character right here. Okay. He's a guardian spirit of the earth. <clears throat> he has a bow, an arrow and a bow. And uh, he's touching the lifeline. And <clears throat> the Hopi believe that there have been four worlds on this earth, four civilizations of humans. And we are just finished up the fourth world, uh, December 21st, 2012. And the, the, the Mayan and Hopi um, are very uh, connected in their beliefs and their and their religion as well, their spirituality. And Maso travels travels around the world. He circles the world four times with a torch to keep everything turning the way it should. And the Hopis believe that each of those worlds were destroyed. And the reason why they first, uh, I believe, one was destroyed by fire, one by flood and one by ice. And each time they were destroyed because the human civilization had become very, very 
very greedy and very disrespectful to the earth and, and uh, not treating one another and the animals right. And they became very greedy. And so each time, uh, Mother Earth and the Spirit had to cleanse the earth. And the Hopis believed that they were in the, un the underworld down below the Grand Canyon. That was the world that they came from. And <clears throat> this is the line on the Prophecy Rock. This is the lifeline of the fourth world. And they came up through an entrance in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And it's called the Sipapu. This is the Sipapu. Can you say that word again a little slower? Sipapu. 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 So this is the Sipapu. This is the the uh, entrance in the Grand Canyon, and it also represents the teachings that are passed down from generation to generation uh, through their oral traditions. This circle represents uh, that we are all one and all life is connected. So as the Hopis came up and they emerged from the Grand Canyon, they went on a, migrations, four migrations, and they were instructed to go to the east, to where the uh, Turtle Island, the continent, North American continent, uh, meets the shore of the ocean, and then from there travel to the north, where the ice and the snow gates would uh, keep them from going any further north. And then from there, all the way to the west, to the ocean. And um, I have heard recently that when the Hopis, this makes sense to me, that many, 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 many years ago, they actually uh, evolved from Tibet. And they migrated and crossed over the land bridge, perhaps, and then traveled down uh, all the way down on along the coast of America, Mexico, and South America, and then came up the other side. And they spent quite a bit of time in Palenque, and they called it the, the City of Red because it was, uh, the pyramids were washed with a, a ochre, reddish ochre substance, so that they glowed red at night, at, in the evening. So this, this lifeline is very, very important. And as it comes up like this, it's not, uh, how would you say, it's not represented like a map where you could say, okay, this, this much means so many years. Not at all. It's, um, it's not done like that. So as it, as it comes up, this is the, the sacred way. This is the sacred path, the red road or the, the peaceful way of life along here. And then this one up here is the road that humans have taken. That And these characters up here represent the ones whose heads are not connected to their hearts. <laughs> and Grandfather David told me when he was a little boy there were no, and actually you can see it here, it looks like their heads are floating above their bodies. And he said when he was a little boy, that's how it was. But at some point, somebody scratched necks on them. Uh, and they are the ones who are very materialistic. They want to have their, their conveniences and their comforts. They're very greedy. They're very clever. And they're very strong, and you see how they're connected. They have a lot of uh, holding on to each other's hands, so they're, they're very strong. And they're leading the people down the path. This is called the zigzag path to annihilation. See how it stops here? Yeah. That's the zigzag path to annihilation. And this... Okay, we'll look at the bottom line for a minute. So, on the bottom line, 
these these circles represent the um, World War One and World War Two, and then this one is yet to come, and they're called the Great Earth Shaking Events, the three Great Earth Shaking Events, each one becoming more powerful than the other. Right here is this line is the path of going to and fro and that after World War II there would be a time when people who've been following the materialistic way would cross over that path and they would start walking on the peaceful spiritual path and some of the people that had been on the spiritual path would cross up here and they would travel on the materialistic path so this time of going to and fro has happened for a while and then uh, this event is also called the mystery egg. And it's not known if it's going to be a very good thing or a very bad thing or maybe a combination of both. And then further down this line, you can see the corn plants. There's corn plants. And this is a Hopi where's elder. The, where's the corn plant? Here's a corn plant right here. Oh, yeah. And he is... He's walking with his planting stick, and he's planting corn along the path of peace. And this line goes, this is kind of the edge of the front face of the prophecy rock, and then it continues also around the side. So this is the path that will continue, and this is the path that we should be on. And... Now, you, you uh, were explained this by David at his house or home in... No, right at the Prophecy Rock. Oh, at the Prophecy Rock. Yeah, he, the two of us together went up one day. He said, let's go up there. So this was after the New Mexico gathering that you got to know him and started visiting him. Right. In Oribe or Hotavia. Hotavia is where Grandfather lives in Hotavia. Say, say, say it again. Hotavia. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes he loved to make jokes, and he says, "There's a hot via, hot via, where the hot people live." Didn't you tell me that he used to say something about opening up something on the top of your head? Yes, and this was very important. When I would come and visit him, uh, the first thing he would do, he would greet me at the door with a prayer, and fling the door open and say, "All I want is for all the children." to drink the sweet milk of the Mother Earth, all the children everywhere. And he would say that prayer as he opened the door. And then when I'd be sitting next to him sometimes, he would go like this to me. He'd give me this pretty sharp pat right on the top of my head, like that. And he'd say, open the door at the top of your head. And by that, he meant, open that door to Great Spirit to be able to listen and to hear the spirit and that the messages and that spiritual voice is inside all of us.